and hello outcast I'm gonna wait until there's a few more people and yes this is my title card and I my, my screen yes once I have a reasonable number of people I'm gonna go ahead and start the actual broadcast no outcast I can't I've got to wait till I get people watching you know stuff like that It will be in just a minute, Brandon. I'm waiting to get just a few more people, and for some reason, it's not showing me the number of people watching the feed. Yes, yes, I, I know it's five people, but it's not showing... There we go. Now it's showing me the number of people watching since I'm live. And hello, Koopa. Okay. 30 seconds, it will be 8 o'clock my time, which is when I said I was going to do this. So, let's get to the main camera so I can say hello. And yes, this is me. Now, normally, I have a little fuzzball sleeping right there, but she's going to go get food. Okay. Now, like I said, this is pretty much going to be how I, at least, sculpt a miniature for 3D graphics. And, oh, I better go ahead and pop onto Facebook for a moment and let people know I'm live. Um... Yeah. Now, Brandon, procrastinating on an essay, and we all do it. All right. Now, on future episodes, what I will most commonly do is I'll ask for suggestions from the audience, from the viewers, what kind of miniature I'm going to sculpt. But tonight, I actually have a specific figure I'm going to be sculpting, as is noted there. Oh, hey. Hey. Fuzzbutt. Up here. Good girl. Yes, they respond when called. This is Shinju. She's 12. And she loves her daddy. Anyway, but as noted in the title below, this is going to be a High Elven Druid. It's a specific character from my Saturday Night game. Uh, the reason being is, now that I have my own custom ge geometry I can work from, I'm going to be completely redesigning the miniatures that I made for my Saturday game players. Uh, right now, I'm going to have to be just the males. I don't have a base female geometry yet, but I will soon. So, a writing cat. I, I think Shinji would have something to say about that. Anyway, so let's see. I guess we can start with, um, this is Daz Studio. This is the program I make my living in. And what you're seeing on the screen is basically just the default male geometry that I created for making miniatures on. Now you'll notice that it's not normal human proportions. I mean the head's weird, the hands and feet are huge, and it's just not normal. That's because if I used a normal human proportion when printing a miniature, the hands, you can you should be able to see my my uh cursor, the hands right here would be just, you know, far too small. So would the feet. The head, specifically the eyes, 
and the and the facial features just even if I had a perfect print of this at that size you really couldn't see them so instead I have these proportions these altered proportions larger hands bigger feet bigger head wider shoulders that is what the default figure looks like now one thing I've done to it this program lets you make what's called morphs or blend shapes in what some other programs call it I use it to represent different races like elf you see how as I turn this dial he gets taller and thinner and grows pointy ears gnome it's shorter pointy ears and a big old nose goblin shorter uglier and skinnier halfling shorter chubbier and orc and yes if I wanted to make a half orc I put it at 50 percent now the figure that we're going to be making today the character's name is Virgil yes Virgil and he is a high elf now normally in D&D &D, elves are slightly shorter than humans but in my campaign world they're not they're slightly taller like in almost everything else besides D&D &D. so my elves are taller and slightly thinner now you can see the basic shape of this elf the ears are really thick because otherwise they won't print now this particular critter this character is not like your standard druid he doesn't use a scimitar or a sickle or a shillelagh he's a high elf so he uses a bow now over here down on the lower left I have all sorts of props that I've made specifically for this character so I load in the bow and if you'll notice the hand automatically closed around the bow that's because when I made it I saved that hand pose alongside the bow now as he has a bow he also really needs a quiver and because he's going to be wearing a cloak it's going to be a hip quiver which also loads in in position on the back of the hip so yes and hello Coro and object underscore object so yeah that's basically you know the, the step one for what I'm working on next is he's going to be wearing basically a kilt so this under normal circumstances would be loaded in to represent a tunic because when I take it in for later I would be smoothing in the top edge so it looked like it's part of a tunic however since this character actually wears a kilt it will be staying as it is now he also wears a cloak but that's the last thing I'm going to add and it's from here that we're going to determine what pose we're going to do with the figure so on the one hand you know you want something that's nice and exciting but the problem with sculpting for 3d printing is you want to be able to use as few supports as possible now what do i mean by supports well basically let me go ahead and pop back to the main camera if I was printing a figure and that figure had its arm out like this and it just tries to follow the line of the arm as it prints each layer there's nothing holding the plastic over here up it's just gonna droop it's gonna turn into basically spaghetti so instead what we do is we have like a scaffolding it's a very thin very light amount of material that is just far enough to support the bits and pieces anything that sticks down needs a support on the bottom or it's just gonna spool out into open air so 
if we can get our pose that it uses the least amount of supports possible that's great because when you remove a support you leave behind a little bit of residue a couple little white spots maybe tiny little bits and pieces of the support material now I have here now here it is this is the figure that I sculpted on Thursday I went ahead and printed it now let me go ahead and zoom in so you can see how it looks right now I gave it what's called zenithal priming what that means is I painted it black then from a 45 degree angle I painted it medium gray and then from directly above a light dusting of white now if you look on the bottom of the swords bring it in even closer and focus you can see how it's very very rough there that's because when I designed this miniature I did not design it as well as I could have for printing which means there were a lot of supports across the underside of these swords that's something that we're going to try to avoid because the cleaner the print the cleaner the miniature and the easier it is to paint hmm. sorry I got a little bit of an it now let's get back to the program now all right okay one thing that's going to happen is that bow is going to need supports no matter what we do with it so let's go ahead and start from the lower body we select the leg and I have a the parameters here we've got bend twist uh, bend is the red one twist is the green blue uh, side to side is blue however when I click on the arm twist is red side to side is green bend is blue the reason for that is the color isn't dependent on what it does you know twist is basically turning around the lengthwise and yes you can go pretty ridiculous distances I I haven't optimized that but you know inside you know bend is forward and back it's the most common direction that it bends and side to side is the second most common direction that it bends You'll also notice that, for example, that side to side, it has a pretty significant distortion of the torso. That's something we're actually going to be fixing in ZBrush. This is mostly just for the initial pose and the presence of the geometry that we're going to be playing around with. Now, the what it is, is there's X, which is vertical. No, sorry, X is, the, is side to side. Y is vertical and Z is forward and back so if you imagine pins along those axes X in the case of the leg you're moving through the pin that's forward and back when you move through the pin that's up and down it twists <coughs> and when you move from the pin that's stuck in the front it moves side to side and it's a good idea if you're ever going to do something like this to make sure that you have your you know idea of what direction the pins go so what we're gonna do is we're going to just move the legs just a little bit side to side not a lot because he's gonna be standing kinda of proud now the thing is we want a bit of a dynamic pose to begin with so what we're going to do is we actually need our hip to be slightly angled. The reason for this is for a realistic pose. The hip, the line of the hip, and the line of the shoulders, number one, should never be parallel to the ground. And number two, should never be parallel to each other. Unless you are, you know, in an actual full military at attention stance, your torso is bent even slightly along all three axes it might be twisted a little bent forward and slightly to the side not huge amounts but just a couple of degrees just enough to make it more natural more organic so we've got the hip selected 
We're going to twist it a little bit away. Well, sorry, that's translate. That's I'm going to twist it just a couple degrees away from forward. Uh, we're going to bend it forward a little bit. Oh, wrong way. Yeah, we're going to bend it forward just a little bit. But we're not going to worry about twisting the hip because, you know, that, that will be determined when you turn the miniature. Now you notice that the feet are actually starting to go through the floor here. You can see the lines of the floor are going through the feet. And if I go to a front view and zoom in, you'll see that they are in fact going through. So, first things first, let's go ahead and flatten those feet out a little bit. So we're going to bend them up just a bit. And that probably needs to be a little bit more, so I'm going to manually enter it in. Minus 8. Minus 10. Yeah, minus 10 seems to be about right for that one. Whereas for this one, since you were not quite on center, it's bending forward a bit. You'll also notice that even flat, because we tilted him, his right foot's a little bit lower. So what we're going to do is we're going to bend the, le the right leg ever so slightly. And then bend the... Not enough. And... Still not quite enough, so let's go ahead and bring this a bit further down side to side. And now our feet aren't flat anymore, so we got to rebend the feet. And let's go back to our perspective view. Now the legs already look more natural. And that was just tweaking the feet to fit an off-balance uh, hip. Now, we're going to have the bow down to his side a little bit and his right hand standing, holding up like he's casting a spell. The reason for this is he's a druid. And yes, he uses that bow a lot, but he's also a primary spellcaster and ignore the, the, the butt that's poking through. So the, the uh, abdomen, we're going to side to side there. We're going to twist it just a little bit and we're going to bend back just a little bit. And that's mostly just to help change the angle. Bend the torso forward and slip it back the other side because he's going to be reaching up but we keep twisting in the same direction as the abdomen did. Okay, let me poke in, peek into chat. Yes, everyone has a subtle tilt, Koro. Yes, it's a pokey butt, but it's something that will be fixed in when we get into ZBrush. For one, the butt's going to be covered by the uh, by the kilt. All right, now I'm going to go ahead and move the neck and head. The neck is going to be more straight up than it is currently. But it's also not going to be facing the same way. So we're going to do that. Then we're going to twist the head just a little bit more. All right, we've got to bend it backwards because we want it to be as straight up as possible because he's casting and he wants to look proud while he does it. Okay, now we're going to move the arm that is controlling the bow. We're going to bring the lower arm down close to the torso. 
and tilt the bow back so that it's slightly behind his torso. So we start with the collarbone. Now the collarbone controls movement along this way. It's something that we can do that a lot of people forget about in, th in a lot of animation. Case in point, uh, you've seen Final Fantasy Spirits Within. I'm almost certain you have. There's a lot of scenes where if you watch them, they move entirely from the shoulder with no collar movement at all. This makes those arm movements look extremely uncomfortable and unnatural, and it's part of what gave it the Uncanny Valley hit that it had. So we're going to go ahead and... Okay. Judging by how my own arm moves when I do that, it's going to twist and move forward slightly. So we're going to side to side, forward, but we're also going to twist it down. Then the arm will also twist the upper arm because of the way it's handled. We're going to bend it a bit down towards the torso. And we're going to continue to twist because that didn't twist far enough. Then here we're going to bend it out. And we're going to look to see, nope, it is poking through the leg and the kilt. So what we got to do here is unbend it just a little. Well, to, yeah, unbend it just a little and twist the forearm just a little. Oh, to wrong direction. There we go. Now, this shoulder is going to go up and back just a little because he wants to hold that arm up high, but it's going to twist a lot because the arm is going to be reaching up. Now, let's go ahead and just make things a little bit easier. Dial in the arm movement. And then it's going to twist, like I said, to make the, uh, a little bit better. Arm is going to bend. Actually, yeah, that's a bit too much. Let's bring it down a little. And then bend the arm just a bit. Now we're going to make the hand into a fist. That way, if someone uses the same miniature for just, like, say, a scout, then he could be giving a hand signal for the unit to stop, just as an example. Okay. If you made a crouching character like this guy, it actually doesn't really change the amount of time it takes to print, not that I noticed, but it changes the amount of support material you have to use. Okay, a standing figure actually takes a lot less support. Um, in this case, it was a matter of when I use the rotational tool here in the window, it's much easier to see exactly which axis I'm going to be needing to, to move. So, for example, here I need to slide the hand slightly to the side. I'm going to select the fingers. Now, that's another thing. This model, the fingers are not independent. So I'm just going to select the lower fingers. We're actually I'm going to start with the uh, tips of the fingers and we're going to bend them. Then we're going to select the upper fingers. 
bend them. And I need to bend the lower fingers a bit more because yeah, and then and then I'll be able to tweak it in ZBrush. I'm also going to have to tweak this. Yes, I did not notice that error right there. It looks like there may be some geometry affected by the by the arm. I'll have that fixed before the next show. Now, we're going to bring bring this up. Bend this. And the end result is a fist. Bring it up a little bit less. And there we go. We got a fist. So now we zoom back out and we have the basic pose. The torso is a little a little overdone. So let's just kind of Especially the side to side parts. Now, remember, this is just for the base pose and the basic geometry. Now we're going to do the next part, which is the cloak. Load it in, and the cloak's in place. Now, I could leave it just as it is. However, we can also tweak it a little bit. You'll notice that I've made the cloak itself have multiple different body segments. So what we'll do is we'll twist this lower part of the cloak so that we can and then bend it out a little. So we can make it look like this bow is actually, you know, pushing out the cloak a little. And that's a little too far. Let's bring it back in. Okay. And then we take the opposite side and we Y rotate it back towards the rest. Now, again, this is just basic geometry. It is not how the final result will look. This is the basics for what we're going to be sculpting on. So, Nothing on the thighs. We have our basic figure, which is the overall elf. We have his bow. We have his skirt. We have his cloak. And we have, kind of hidden but still printable, his arrows. Now, there's one thing missing. Can anyone tell me what they see that is missing? Mm hmm? Yes, I use a 0 0.4 millimeter nozzle. But yeah, there's still one thing missing. Mm. That's true, he is missing boots, but that will come later. I'll show you why. He's, much of what he is, much of his, most of his clothing will actually come in the sculpting phase. The only reason that the kilt doesn't is because it has to have a solid piece underneath. Basically, if you look underneath, it's solid there. Makes it a lot easier to print.
the hair will come during the sculpt. Anyone else? I'm going to get two more answers, and then I'll tell you. Let's see what we got after. Aha! Deacon got it. The base. It is missing a base. So, file, import. I'm going to have to get this base. I'm just going to use a basic base. Oh dear, it swallowed up his feet. Well, that's okay, because all we have to do now is just lower it. It's what's called the Y translate. Move it along the Y axis. And we have... Well, he's not standing in the right spot. Let's move it forward a bit. Too far forward. And... There. That is what the final miniature will end up looking like. Well, after we sculpt it, of course. So, that was half an hour, and we have the figure in a basic pose on, a ba on its base and its basic equipment. Now, what's going to happen? The next bit is I'm going to hide all of his props and his clothing and the base because I'm going to export them as separate things. Now, File, Export, and we're going to put this under Broadcast Miniatures. And that's going to be High Elf Druid Body. I'm then going to hide him and open up his, or uh, show his bow, his quiver, and his. No, let's make the let's make the uh, tunic skirt separate. And his base. This is going to be the next bit. File, export, high elf druid extras one. Okay. And now we hide these guys and have the tunic and cloak visible. File, export, high elf druid extras to... Oh, wait, no, I better... Before I do that, the cloak and the tunic bit better be separate. The reason being is we're going to be working on the tunic bit to make his belt. And we need to be able to get behind it. So, high elf druid tunic skirt. And then finally, make that invisible and make the cloak visible. And that's going to be high elf druid cloak and let's make everything visible again just because and we're gonna stay we're gonna leave this as it is right here but we're going to move into our next uh, particular thing and that's going to be the next program of ZBrush so now I make ZBrush visible. Hey, look, it's a star. What's it, this star? I'll tell you this star. This star is empty geometry. This is a placeholder that's simply called Polymesh 3D. I go over here to where it says import. And I import from meshes, which called minis, broadcast miniatures, Hi, Elf Druid. I'll start with the body. And it loads. And this is the basic geometry once again. Now, for the additional parts, we do what's called a subtool. I am not exactly certain how this is handled in Mudbox or Sculptress or other sculpting tools. 
in ZBrush, you create what's called a subtool. And we append another PolyMesh 3D, focus on it, import the cloak. Then we append PolyMesh 3D, focus on it, import the extras. Append PolyMesh 3D, import the tunic. Now, you can make any individual piece visible or invisible as you choose, unless it's the one that you're currently clicked on, which, as you can tell by the fact that it's white instead of gray, currently is the skirt. But we're going to focus on the cloak, actually, first. Because there's one thing we have to do to it. We have to fix that right shoulder, and then we have to make it higher polygons. I mean, you can see all of the different polygons that make up this cloak. That means it's very, very messy right now. It's low res. It'll show up faceted. It's not going to be fun. Now, the way we're going to fix that cloak at the shoulder... The first thing we're going to do is I'm going to smooth it out. You'll notice that all of a sudden, instead of being red like it is now, the cursor is blue. That's because it's set to smoothing. And as I stroke over the cloak, it gets smoother. Now, I also want to smooth the top of this, but for a totally different reason. And that's that, you know, if you look at it when the character is visible, that part's kind of sticking up a bit, and we don't necessarily want it to. Now I'm going to move it, and pardon me for blocking the screen for a moment, but as we're starting to get into ZBrush, I'm going to get my primary tool. This is my Wacom. There are many like it, but this one is mine. I love my Wacom. It's a stylus. And uh, in addition, you know, what, what good is a, a, a Wacom drawing tablet without the actual drawing stylus? So I have my stylus. Now, yeah, we're kind of looking at a weird angle. I'm going to go ahead and move it back towards the center. Rotate it around a little bit until I can get a good view of it, and I'm going to pull this away from the back of the shoulder to make the brush a little bit bigger. I'm hitting the closed brackets, the square brackets, bringing it up a little bit, and bring this down just a little bit. Now, I'm going to start dragging it around his neck. Because this is not a superhero costume. This is a woodsman's cloak that he wears to keep warm. So instead of having, you know, just tucked into the back of his super suit, it is most likely... tied around his neck. Now what we're going to do here is we're going to lower it in to the neck. Now why? Didn't I just say that it's probably tied around his neck? Well, we'll get to that when we do his, when do we do his actual clothing. And now, go ahead and make the brush smaller, and I'm going to smooth this wrinkle. Oh dear, I just smoothed it straight into him. Well, fortunately, there's a transparency. I make it bigger again and pull it up. Now, zoom out and move it more towards the center. And let's make it smooth but a lot, a lot more gently so we can smooth out some of the wrinkles and weirdisms that we're getting. Now, you'll notice that for a cloak, that's pretty thick. Most cloaks aren't, you know, a hand's width thick. That's because, well, it's got to be thick to print well. 
A blender does have a sculpt mode. I don't know how powerful it is, and I don't know what you can really do with it. So I'm pretty much sticking with ZBrush for my sculpting. Now, the next thing that we need to do is we need to make it a higher resolution, because again, you can still see all of those polygons. So we go over here, and instead of subtool, we open up geometry. You can divide a couple times. That's yeah, it got up to 90,000 polygons, and now it's really, really, really high res. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to add in wrinkles. Now that's pretty easy to do. The problem is where, not so much how, but where, because. If I just start drawing in lines, it won't look like it's a wrinkled cloak hanging from his shoulder. It'll just look like a bunch of weird lines. So I undo those. We also need to make the brush smaller, as you just saw. Now, it's actually better, instead of doing it with a nice broad brush, to do it with an angled brush, a sharp brush, the slash brush. Again, not like that. We need it not as deep and a little bit wider. And the end result will be that we can draw in our wrinkles. Let's untransparent it. Let's make it opaque again. And once we've gotten the location of the depth of the wrinkles in, we can then draw in a few other things. The peaks of the wrinkles, for example. Now the thing is, in this, used like this, the smooth actually becomes almost an eraser. It relaxes the polygons around it. Now I'm going to zoom in close to the back of the neck. And what I'm going to do here, I'm going to make it smaller and I'm going to draw in the wrinkles from being around the neck. And I'm going to smooth out the areas here. Now I need to make it a little bit bigger because those wrinkles will not be able to be seen on a printed miniature unless you got like, you know, the God printer. Let's make them a little bit deeper. and then down. There's also ones coming from this way. Ah, uh, didn't work. Let's make it a little bit deeper and a little bit smaller. Now what we'll do is we'll make it Z add, zoom out a little bit, make it bigger, and we're going to sharpen the tops of the wrinkles. The reason for this is you may think, oh yeah, cloth's like super flexible. It is, but it bends along the lines of the thread, along the warp and weft as they're called. Now, we just drew on the lines. That's not going to be great. It looks good on a couple of them, but we're going to need to smooth out the rest. Polish it, so to speak, right along the edges, and right along the body of where those edges are. Let's shrink the brush again and polish it a bit. And for the most part, the cloak is ready. Ready for what you say? Well, I did something today specifically for this cloak that I think that the person who 
I'm making this miniature for would appreciate. You see what I'm doing? I'm going to show how to add a pattern to something. I am about to start masking off this cloak. Okay. Hmm, I need to make that... You'll notice that it's kind of erratic and raggedy. I don't like that. So what I'm going to do is there's a function called Lazy Mouse. I turn it on, and what ends up happening is, as I draw, it follows, it lags behind a certain distance. In this case, I'm going to make that Lazy Radius a little bit longer, Now the pattern I'm going to be putting on here, you might be wondering what it is. And I'm going to tell you in just a minute. What I got to do is I got to finish masking off the back of the cloak. See, what I'm going to do is, he, this character is a druid, you know, a nature priest, and yet they're being found underground, rampaging through tombs and cave systems, so they might want something that, you know, help them feel a little bit more at home, that they're not feeling underneath the ground. Just some little bits of nature. So, on the back of their cloak, they're going to have these. Alright, now I'm turning off the lazy mouse, because I don't need to draw those lines anymore. And I'm... Oh, turn off the lazy mouse. And I'm just going to scritch it in. I don't want to use too thick of... I don't want to use a larger cursor, because then that would also be, you know, dealing... You know, it would be start masking in the other side, which we don't want because what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be adding in these details. Oh heck, and I just realized that there's still not enough geometry for what I want to do. And I'm masking it. Oh dear, what will I do? Well, what I'm going to do first, let me finish masking it off. Because what I have to do is going to be very specific. You can see, you know, let me zoom in a little bit. You can see the squares still of the geometry. All right. Now, and there. We want to give it a little bit of a seam. So we're going to turn Lazy Mouse back on. This time we're going to erase the very edge of the mask to act like there's a hem around what we're doing. You know, like, they actually know what they're doing with cloth, which I, you know, it means they're, they're doing better than I am. I'm lucky if I make my T-Tune looks look good. And I need to go back up a little because I started bouncing off the edge for a little bit there. 
Okay, now let's turn off the lazy mouse because I've just noticed i got to zoom in a little bit and undo this. Well, let's shrink the cross size because we don't want to go through the other side. And let's erase a little bit around the neck. Now, zoom out again. And there we have it. It's masked off for what's going to be what's going to be. So what we do now is we get on to masking. And do we have an option to save the mask? No, we do not. So what we're going to do is we're going to have to first, we're going to invert the mask. So now the only thing we can adjust is what's currently in there. And then go back to the geometry. We're going to divide. We zoom in. And what you'll see is that it actually did in fact divide only what was unmasked. We're going to do it again. Which is what we need. That way we don't have millions of polygons for just that. Now, we're going to go down to deformation. And we're going to sink it in a little bit. Just a bit, just enough to where it'll be noticeable on the print. Now the next thing we're going to do is where it's get fancy. And it poke over here. And hello, Baloo. Um, Deacon, I would actually pull the hood from the cloak geometry. I would, I'll show you how I would do it in a minute when I get around to actually showing you how I'm going to add like the little leather breastplate, the belt, the boots, the bracers, and even the hair. Um, yeah, once you get, once you learn the basic techniques, it's like, well, it's kind of like what uh, Billy said. It's like there's only eight notes and a handful of half notes in between, sharps and flats, but that could be everything from Friday, Friday, you know, to Beethoven's Fifth, whatever. All right, let me pop back into ZBrush now. I'm going to load in what's called an alpha. Alphas are black and white images. And what these images are for, view, show, Large icons. Aha, here it is. Images, what these images are for is they determine how much of an influence that we're about to have. Oops. Got to be on standard for this. And let's to zero and drag rect. And we're going to Z sub. Let's make it big, deep. Now, I place this mouse here and I start dragging. Oh, you see that it now Okay. Now it looks like leaves on the back. I can undo that, and we've got that. That is the cloak with the leaves on the back. Now let's make the cloak invisible. 
and we're going to the skirt because what's going to happen is first things first we're going to need to move that that we need to drag it away from the butt a bit and so it's no longer on the butt now the thing is it's from this that we're going to be getting our belt so it needs to have its geometry increased quite a bit every time I click this button over here where it says divide the number of polygons is multiplied by four that's because each square is divided in half both directions so that's one polygon becomes one two three four and once again you can see the polygons in the person but now you can also see that each polygon has been subdivided several times if I delete the lower we can see the size. We can also see that we're going to need to pull the belly out a little bit. No, we're not going to. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to about the width of the belt that we want, which is about there. And when masking, we want that lazy mouse on. What's going to happen is I'm going to make it a little bit lower than the bottom of the skirt and you'll notice that once again it's coloring in the squares that we're marking let's turn off the lines because it's harder to see oh good thing I'm still on move I missed a spot oh make it big so that the bigger it is the the, the better the blend Okay, and that's, yeah, that's about right. Hmm, we're going to have to turn the person off because his hand's in the way. Okay, so now we could take this and we bring it around. And finally bring it across and make the connection here. Now, we have where the belt would be marked off. So how do we turn that into a belt? Well, there's an option in the subtool menu called Extract. And it just so happens that the scale we're working with, the default settings are perfect for creating something that will be a visible ridge, a visible change in layer height at when 3D printed. And this is it. Now, we need to go ahead and accept. And what it did was it actually created a new subtool. If I switch back to the uh, skirt and make it invisible, I can still see the mask. Well, let's go ahead and erase the mask because we don't need it anymore. We then load, we then make the uh, human visible, and we can see the belt and the skirt. Now, belts need belt buckles, don't they? Yes. Okay, so what we're going to do, we're going to go ahead and go back to the skirt, and we're going to draw on, well, this time we're going to turn off the, the lazy mouse, and we're going to draw on basically a big old circle. And now that we've done that, we can turn the belt on so we can see it 
but now we're going to extract again, but this time the thickness of the extraction is 0 0.02. As we saw, that's enough to make that nicely distinct belt. But if we do it again, it's going to blend with the belt. So we're going to make it 0 0.04. Extract, and we have our belt buckle. Now, we go up, we select and what we have now is we have all of the clothing that we need for the uh, skirt. However, that's not all the clothing the character has. The character also has boots with open toes, a leather breastplate that mostly covers his ribcage area, bracers, and a single shoulder pauldron. The concept art offered to me by the person who's, ma who's playing this character had the single pauldron on the right shoulder. I think it would be better served to be on the left shoulder simply because, number one, that's the bow side. And that's the side you're going to be pointing towards the enemy. Number two, his right arm's up. If I put a pauldron right here, it starts getting a little persnickety. Yes, I said persnickety. So we're going to start with the boots. As things stand, what I can do is I can tilt ever so slightly, come back around, I then mask off. I didn't do it enough. I'm trying to tilt so that the leg is perfectly upright when looked looked at from the front. Like that. Oh, that's right. Before I do that, I need to increase its geometry quite a lot. So, divide, divide, divide. And delete the lower. Oh, I should not have done that. Undo. The reason being, I should not have deleted it. Okay, there we go. And a mask there. And we're going to unmask the toes. Now, we're going to need to pull it back down. There we go. And let's bring this up to about the same height. And then once again, unmask the toes. And that's where his boots are going to be. We go back down to extract. And this time we can go back to point zero 0.02. Extract. Accept. Now, at this scale, from our point of view, that kind of looks like he's wearing, you know, ca uh, ca you know, casts. But when we actually print it, it's going to be a very, very small shift in layer. Okay, that's that. Next thing is going to be the bracers. I'm going to make the bracers actually different styles. The reason for this is, well, because asymmetry helps. We already have asymmetry. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I'm getting out of order here. What I need to do first is I need to tweak the geometry of the torso, since most of it's going to be exposed. And since when you bend those arms in Daz Studio, it's leaving some weird divots. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to sculpt. Now, it's a druid, not a warrior. He doesn't need to be super muscular, but he still needs those landmarks defined. So, we're going to drop this down, and we're going to expand on his biceps a little bit. Now, as you see, it already looks more like a bicep. The bicep 
uh, connects underneath. Stop that. Yeah. Bicep connects underneath. Oh, that's too big. The where the pectoral and the uh, shoulder muscle, the deltoid, connect. Now I need to lower the geometry de uh, level of details. as I do this because it's a lot easier to smooth and then subdivide than to try to do it all in the, in the heavy subdivisions. Now, a bowman, even if he is an elf and even if he is just a druid, has a bit more developed forearm than your average. I'm not going to be ridiculous about it, but I am going to make certain that he does have a decently developed forearm as well as a decently developed elbow because that's going to be something that's going to be seen is the bend of the elbow. Drop down the size, extend a couple details, and then you'll notice that so most of you have little tiny protrusions on the sides of the wrist those protrusions, we're going to exaggerate a little bit, just to point out that they exist. And we're also going to increase the deltoid just a little. Once again, it's a it's an archer, so he would have a bit more developed deltoid. His pectorals wouldn't necessarily be so much developed. In fact, we're going to go ahead and reduce them even more. Because this, the pectorals are going to be covered with the breastplate. And the breastplate is not going to be as detailed as a human torso. It's just going to be vaguely similar. We're going to smooth this out because we're going to have to. It's got too much of a wrinkle, and let's go ahead and remove the alpha and put this back to dots. We're gonna oh, too much. And dig in here a little bit, and then we're gonna dig out here. We're going to maneuver that around with the move tool and kind of pull it back a bit. Now the thing is, this back muscle here didn't bend properly when we created the pose, so we're paying for it now. And the other thing is, the back no human shoulder blade bends like that so we're going to go ahead and we're going to use the move and the smooth to make it a little bit easy a little bit better now i would go in and add more detail onto the scapula the the shoulder the uh shoulder blades but we don't want to do that because it's going to be covered in the breastplate zoom in shrink and we're going to smooth this out And let's go ahead and start enlarging, embiggening the bicep. Yes, I said embiggening. It's a perfectly cromulent word. I don't know what you're talking about. Mm. 
Now, you'll notice this does not quite look normal. We're going to have to go ahead and move this back in. Once again, it's an issue from the method I used to pose it. Looks like the only major thing I have left to do for the general physicality of it is I need to move this up just a little. And then I need to do his forearm and this pectoral. This part of the pectoral right here. Now what we're going to do, we're also going to change the shape of that pectoral because it doesn't look right. That pectoral should be almost a straight vertical there. Now up here, shrink down that. And here we're going to go ahead and fix this. Remember I mentioned we're going to fix that in ZBrush. And standard, let's bring out that forearm muscle. There's a forearm muscle that anchors in on either side of the bicep. If you try and make a, make a fist, you'll notice there's like a little divot from where the bicep attaches because there's one coming from here that connects back over here and one coming from here that broadly stretches across. There's also, like I said, there's, we've got to have that elbow, and there's also muscles on the back of the forearm right along here but we're going to blend those in because we don't need the, the big forearms okay and we're going to smooth that just a little that's all the geometry for the torso we really need to tweak right now well let's go ahead and undo that so the next thing to do is the bracers we're going to put a bigger bracer on this one. Now we take it and we go back up to the full subdivision. And it's nicely smooth. I'm going to put a bigger bracer on this arm. Why, you might ask? Because I feel like it would be, be fancier. We're already going to have the shoulder plate on the right, on the left arm. So we just give them a little bit bigger bracer on the right. Okay, now. I'm going to go ahead and move over to this arm. I'm going to shrink the... We're just going to add in a little bit of a wristband. Stupid autosave. It's good, but it can be a pain. Okay, now zoom out. And once again, we're going to extract. We go back up to the subtool. And we hit extract. Yay! Accept it. 
Yes. So now we have those bracers. But they're kind of boring. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead on this one at least and we're going to add on some trim. How did I learn Daz Studio? Um, wow. Uh, I've been using it for work for about 15 years. Yeah, that, that's, that's what I work in is Daz Studio. Anyway, I have noticed that I've lost some people, so apparently they're not big on the sculpting stuffs. All right, now, let's go ahead and once again we're going to mask off the bottom. Just, we're going to come back in and tweak the size of the mask in just a second. Mask off the bottom. And then we're going to mask off the top. Oh, not enough. Yeah, mask off the top. Alright, so now we're going to use Control Alt to erase some of this. Try and even out the size of the trim. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like painting in Photoshop right now. Okay, and we're going to extract one more time. Accept it. Now, what we're also going to do is we're going to add in some little bulgy dots. So, make it a little bit bigger. And two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, and one, two, three. Next up is the breastplate. So we've got to go back to our human, our basic form. And what we're going to do is we're going to mask off where the breastplate would be from. Now it's going to be kind of a loose fitting breastplate. and relatively short. And this gives us... Now, remember, this is going to be a leather breastplate. We want something kind of smoother than you, you'd get from a metal breastplate. And much of the back detail will be lost behind the uh, cloak and the uh, pose. So 
we can be a little bit sloppier, but it wouldn't be a good idea to do so. So we do the air. And now we go ahead, close that off over here, and fill it in. And we're going to clean up just a little bit. We still want it to look as close to parallel as we can. Hey, come on, girl. Come on up. Good girl. Yeah. So now we turn it around, straighten them up, and we see that we've got a little bit of cleanup here we're left to do. Now, and we extract. And that came out good, so we accept. Clear off. And now the next thing to do is to clean up the breastplate, make it look more natural. But we can't quite do that yet. Because, see when I mentioned I extracted it, what we got to do, if you look, it's only one polygon thick at the edges, right around in here. We gotta change that. Well, one of the tools in ZBrush is called Dynamesh. And we're going to use it. What it does, it remeshes the entire thing that it was just on. Now what this does is number one, it'll help us make it easier because we've just reduced the poly count to smooth up the breast the, air, the chest part to make it look more like it's a loose fitting piece rather than his chest sticking out and smooth out the bottom here because oh too far if you no not too bad okay we want it to be just a hint of the movement underneath. We don't want it to be an exact copy of the movement. Now we divide it, and delete the lower, and you'll see it's actually a lot, more, lot smoother. And smooth the edges on it, and it's a little bit neater. The thing is, a lot of the details that I'm working on right now would barely be seen on most 3D printed miniatures from a home 3D printer. And what's called a fused depo uh, deposition modeling. Or manufacturing, whichever one it really is. I'm not sure still. But if you had access to what's called an SLA printer, which uses resins and high strength UV light, then these details might be visible. Okay, now we're going to sculpt on the shoulder plate. Once again, it's going to be kind of small, but only at first. Okay, now, go ahead and extract it, accept. Okay, now what we need to do, this one needs to be distinct, so we're going to take the move tool, make it bigger, and we're going to 
drag out the bottom of it just a little. Not a huge amount, just a little. And it's entirely possible for us to sculpt something on here, but it's we've been going for about an hour and a half, so I think it's probably best to go ahead and just do what we did before with well, let me this. dynameshing and subdividing the shoulder plate. Now, let's look what we got if we go to the subtools. Let's turn everything on. Let's make the torso what we're focused on. We're missing only one thing. There's one last thing I have to make. Can anyone guess what the last thing I got to do is? Any of the ten of you? Now the belt's done. The hair, right, Deacon? Now the thing is, the example hair that the person who's playing this character gave me is moderately a modern style, and not very elven, but hey, it's what they want. And it's still, you know, as long as we make it kind of messy, we're cool. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the same thing for the hair that we've been doing for everything else. I'm going to pull it off the head, off the base mesh. So first, draw on the basic shape of where it's coming from. This is not the actual scalp line, I should note. It's just that this is where the hair is going to be uh, flowing out. You know, it's heavily, heavily uh, parted to one side. And Alex, if you are in here, can you let me know? Alright. Now the thing is, with the hair, we're not going to be doing every single strand of hair. We're, not, we're going to be doing a basic general shape of the hair. Okay. Now. Let's go ahead and extract this. Accept it. And we draw. The reason I'm drawing like just in general out in open air is it takes turns off the mask. Now, as before, I'm going to dynamesh it. However, I'm going to be a lot smoother on the dynamesh. Now what we're going to do is we're going to smooth out the edges of the hair because hair does not stand out like a layer. I'm also going to have to pull that one sideburn down which is a good thing I've got the move brush currently active. blend around and now the next thing is we go back to that slash tool that I used before 
but we're going to go a little bit smaller and we're going to draw in between where we figure that the oh forgot divide a couple uh, divide at once we're going to go in between where we think that the individual strands would be and then This is very similar to the hairstyle I did last week. It's kind of just mirrored. Last week, I mean Thursday, so it'd be this. It's technically last week, but it's may as well be this week. And one last. Oh, too much. I'm gonna divide it again, so I can come down here. Now. We're going to smooth out this one. That's the basic placement of, the, of them. However, we need to make them bigger. But we need to make them bigger in a way that makes it look more like an organic flow. So we're using the inflate tool. And what this will do is this will round out these strands of hair, these locks, so to speak. It will also make them larger and easier to paint when it, we print out the figure and the person who gets it goes to paint it. And let's divide it again because this is showing some problems. Yeah. Let's smooth out that. And now we're going to swap back to the slash, but we're going to make it add. And we're going to... Oh, too much. We're going to kind of peak the individual hair strands. Once again, this way when the person whose miniature it will be goes to paint it, those peaks will catch the paint a little bit better. Sorry, I had a hiccup. And let's go ahead and try and reorient it back front. It'll also make the hair a little bit bigger, make it look a little messier when it comes time to actually print it out. Now, let's zoom out all the way, and there we have it. We have our basic figure. However, well, I put my tablet up. That is only the second stage. First stage was the basic geometry, and you'll notice it looks a lot better. One thing I've got to do, I just realized, it's a the problem in my mesh. I've got to close the mouth and make the lower lip a little bit bigger. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go back to inflate. Reduce the intensity a little. And I'm going to inflate the lower lip so that it ends up closing the mouth this will make the lower lip also stick out more so it will print better on our poor overworked FDM machines frame it also kind of makes him look like he's scowling a little 
Now, we need to fuse all of this into one figure. So what we do is merge down. Always okay. And then we just start merging down. You notice as I do, a different part of the figure keeps turning white every time I push this button. As it all becomes one solid piece. And we have our druid with his leaf cape, his bow, everything else. Now, the problem with using this in a 3D printer is that a lot of slicers won't like the fact that most of the geometry is not actually physically one single solid watertight surface. Yes, there's a, that's a problem. So what we're going to do is we go back to geometry. Remember that Dynamesh that I used that completely redid the geometry for the breastplate and the shoulder plaid? Pa plaid! And the shoulder plaid! You know, he's got a kilt on his shoulder. Like one of the old great kilts. Uh, shoulder pad. Well, it does something else as well. What it does is it fuses all of the geometry of the mesh into one single manifold surface. And that's what we just did. Now when we zoom in at where, let's say, the breastplate met the body, we'll see that it's actually connected. We turn on the lines, and you can see it may change color, but the lines are actually connected by a series of polygons. So now we have our model, and oh lord, it is 2.273 million polygons. Now most slicers won't like that. They won't like it at all. So we got to reduce the polygon count. Now how are we going to do that? Well, it turns out there's a handy dandy fancy little tool called Decimation Master. I just opened it up right here. And we want it to be about 35,000 points and about 70,000 polygons. That will leave us enough detail and smoothing that it will look really nice even if printed on a resin printer, but low enough resolution that it can be easily sliced by the programs for slice but for FDM. So I push that button, it analyzes the mesh, then it will go in and it will begin to process. You'll see the orange line across the top of the window. As that orange line processes, it will be doing it. Yes, the belt immediately appeared. When you merge with a subtool that is currently invisible, it makes it visible. It pops it on. Because a subtool can only be on or off. And if most of it's on and you merge it with something that's off, well, it all is on. Now, let's see how we're doing. Slip back to ZBrush. And right as I say that, it goes to the next step, which is reordering the vertexes. It's counting it, and then it's writing a file to disk, and then it's going to do the calculations from here to completely reduce it Oh look, it just dropped down. It is 34,972 points, 74,000 polygons. We zoom in, we can see there's a lot more erratic status of the polygons. But when we zoom out to even a level that is, you know, assuming that you have a standard size monitor, many times the size of what the final miniature will look like, you can't see the polygons. And this, my friends, is the finished product of the sculpt. 
I now go ahead and come back up here and I export and it goes into broadcast miniatures and I'm going to call it high elf druid finished so in just under an, or just over an hour and a half I created this from just some basic default geometry I already had prepared. Our high elf druid with a uh, leather breastplate and shoulder pad, bracers, belt, open toed boots, bow, fancy leaf ca uh, cape. Yeah, ain't that fancy? Now, I could do something similar with mail, with chain mail. Uh, but I probably wouldn't because, mo because if you notice on the edges here it doesn't like the way that I did it. It kind of blends them in. But that's okay. Now that it's saved we can go ahead and we're going to go one further place. We're going to go to Craftware. This is the program that takes the actual geometry we just created and slices it layer by layer so that it can be 3D printed. Now, I prefer this particular program. There's dozens of them out there. Well, not dozens. There's, there's a, at least, you know, half a dozen to a dozen. A couple of them are for pay. Craftware is for free. But it's the one I prefer. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to first, before we load in the miniature, I'm going to load in what I call uh, the base measure. This is the cooling tower. And then we load in broadcast miniatures. I all through it finished. Let's slide them over and slide them back a little bit. Now, the cooling tower exists because some of these pieces, like the top of the bow and the hand, as they go up, the 3D print head sits there right above it. Even if you tell it to take a minimum length of time, that just slows things down so that the heat is still right above it. By having that cooling tower about an inch or so away, the heat is moved away giving that layer time to cool before it comes back for the next layer. Now for it to work right it needs to be just a little bit taller than the actual figure. The actual figure we go to scale 44.78 millimeters so we need this to be at least 45 or 46 millimeters. Let's make it 46 millimeters and it just suddenly grew. Now I am going to rotate this to face that way. That's because on my printer, that's the direction the cooling fan is coming from. Which means it tends to get a little bit, of, occasionally we'll have some hairs. What that is, is as the nozzle moves, the fan blowing on it causes some of the plastic to very faintly wisp out. So we want the face, the, we want the front of the miniature to be as clean as possible. And there we have him. So the next thing we do is we decide where to place the supports. And this is where Craftware earns its keep. I can do it automatically or I can manually place them. And with miniatures you want as minimum of uh, support as you can so I'm going to manually place them. I'm going to start off with the bottom of the cape right there. You see where the blue is. Everywhere that is blue is area that has, you know, it's in theory would need a support. So I placed it on the cor on that corner, and this corner. Almost everything else is going to be using a slanted support because I can do it in craftware. I grab and I drag. Oh, 
No, that was the wrong spot. So, go from here to there. And then we need to do it underneath the bow, too. But we're going from the bow... Oh, that's too close. Going from the bow to the base. The reason being is we want it to touch as little of the rest of the figure as possible. So we're dragging it kind of diagonally. And then finally the bottom part of the bow is going over here. And then we need some for underneath the thighs. We're going to bring it forward a little bit just to make it easier to remove when the time comes. And then the bottom edge of the tunic will go to here. Now, this will end up with more support than I would really like. I really wasn't paying attention to what really needed to be done for the supports, but we ended up with a, with a really cool figure anyway. Now, because of a problem I had on a previous figure, I'm going to have to drag the chin out. I ended up with a figure that had a chin that, um, well, was not very happy. And I'm going to put that right there. I want support on the arms. We definitely want support on the arms. This is an elf. He's got weedy, skinny little arms. And let's go ahead and re ba go back to the center. And let's give a couple more supports on the bottom of the cloak. Because that's going to be a heavy piece. In proportion. I mean, plastic's light. Okay, about the only other thing that would need support is underneath here for the arrows. Okay. And yes, it is Brandon Ford. The cooling tower is 6mm by 6mm by whatever height I need it. If I'm making a larger miniature, um, a much bigger figure with a lot of tiny skinny pieces, I'd probably make it 7 or even 8 millimeters. But as it is, this is looking like that's about all of the support I'm going to be putting on... Oh, no, I better put one more on the hand holding the bow. Oh, no, not the hand. Right here. Because there was a little point on the bottom of the bow. And then right next to it is one for the hand itself because there's some bits of the hand that poke down. And then finally, one from the shoulder pad. Going forward. No, nope, wrong direction. One from the shoulder pad, the corner of the shoulder, going forward. Now you'll notice I've given a lot of slanted supports. The thing about those slanted supports is that I can't have them too angled. Otherwise, you know, if I put a support on the thumb out to here, well, for one, it doesn't like it. For another, it won't print. So we put the thumb out to here. It's still angled, but it's not too angled. And now the last thing left to do is slice it. Yes, slice it. So let's go ahead and once again zoom out to extents. And we hit this button. Now, this dialog box has all the different settings that we would need for printing the figure. I already have it set for what is probably the most common settings I use for printing miniatures. For one, I use 0 0.08 millimeter layer height. That means that the, the resolution for vertical. The resolution for horizontal is unfortunately set by the size of my nozzle, which is 0 0.4 millimeters, four tenths of a millimeter. But 
the more vertical resolution, it will still have a nice smoother look to it, at the very least. And I slice. And it goes through. And you'll notice that support has little footprints underneath it. That's called a raft. I put a raft underneath those supports just because they it they are difficult to stick to the bed if they're angled and just standing free, especially like the one that's connected to the chin and nose. Now, this is what he ends up looking like. You can see that we will be able to get detail on the face. The hair ends up looking nice. The uh, leaves look nice. So, what we're going to do is we're going to oh, zoom in. Oh, that's right, because, yeah. We're going to zoom in, and we're going to save it. Save. This is the broadcast miniatures. That's high elf Druid, oops, Druid, not fin not Druidist, finished. And that's it. Now, right now, I cannot print it. But not for any really stupid reason. It's, it's because I normally print, oh, real quick, uh, if we look over here, you can't see it, but the estimated print time for this will be 3 hours and 36 minutes. It'll probably be closer to 5. Uh, it will use 2.7 meters of filament. Now, to give you an idea, this is the size of a filament spool. This is how big they are. Okay. Normally, it's filled to here. That is 1 kilometer. No, sorry, 330 meters. Three of these is a kilometer. One kilogram. 2.7 meters. Insta out of 330, I could print well over 100 miniatures like that on one spool of film, the uh, filament. It's not a spool of film. This is not movies. I did put in a uh, support under the skirt, actually. Um, I only put one support, and I put a couple other supports on the back's outsides. The support, the, the skirt is solid. But anyway, let me go ahead and go back to primary camera. I'm actually kind of surprised that we didn't have any other furball visitors. Anyway. Tonight, I will be printing it. Um, I will also be putting the model up on Thingiverse so that, you know, if you are one of the people who are here because you're a 3D printer and not because you're, you know, a, a friend, friend of mine, you'll be able to try and slice it and print it yourself. And since we got this, we can go ahead. But yeah, that's basically what I do. Again, that's a bit more support than I would prefer, but there's a lot of thin pieces to the, uh, to the, to the uh, elf. It is now 9.52. I started actually working on the sculpt at what, quarter after? So it's just over an hour and a half, I went from basic A-posed male figure to our bow-wielding, leaf-cloak-wearing High Elf Druid in just over an hour and a half. And it's ready for, and it's sliced, and it's ready to print. Now, the reason why I can't print it yet is because I have my Wacom tablet plugged in to one of the uh, few remaining USB slots, and I prefer to print miniatures tethered. This is the USB cord for the tether for my... Uh, CR10. And I've um, got to wait until after I've finished with the broadcast, unplug the Wacom, and plug this back in. 
then I will be able to start printing. And normally I use Ziltec. Ziltec does not support me. I don't have any kind of deal with them or anything like that. I just really like their filament. Mostly because it's, you know, this particular spool has been sitting out for quite some time. And I can bend it double. And it doesn't snap. And this is PLA. Okay? This is PLA, and look what it's doing. It didn't snap. I'd have to bend it back. To break it off. For those who don't know what big deal that is, most PLA, if it's sitting out for, oh, this stuff's probably been out for at least four or five months. If you tried to bend that on normal PLA, it would snap in a heartbeat. On top of that, if you're trying to print with it like that, it will often snap during the print. And that's not good. That's not good at all. You spy a Bensi. You spy a Bensi with a cannon. Whoop, 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 whoop. But yeah, I've got quite a few things that I've done. I've, w rig I've worked up. You know, I've got Dragon Dice Tower. Drop the dice in the mouth. And they come out from back here. That's what you do for the dice that don't behave. You know, and so on and so forth. I've done quite a few 3D models. And yes, Metastrophe, it's for bat Bensi battles. Anyway, I figure probably in about five or ten minutes I'll be going ahead and fading off on yes I also have my mug o can I printed out a little cap to put it on to keep bugs out of it anyway that's absolutely no problem uh, uh, Billy, hold on a second. I seem to have even more lag than what Twitch normally has. So let me refresh the page. Yay. But yeah, from here on out, after this week, uh, the sculpts will be pretty much decided by the audience. So if you can just, you know, when, when I get here, I'm going to say, okay, what do we want to see today? We're going to start sculpting, you know, whatever it is that the audience decides on. And hopefully, you know, we'll get some interesting looking sculpts. So, <laughs> no, no, uh, uh, characters, not things from beyond the stars. And you're welcome, Brandon. <laughs> my computer specs are seven years old. Mm -hmm. My computer is seven years old. So, uh, yeah. I do professional 3D graphics work on a seven-year-old computer. Isn't that just grand? I was going to get a new one. Get this. It was one of those um, from it was one of the game uh, towers from uh, Best Buy. I ordered it. It was going to be two weeks until it shipped the store. The day it was supposed to be in the store, instead they got a message saying, oh yeah, that model, we... Uh, we discontinued it the day before he ordered it, and there was none left. Sorry. And it was one where if you totaled up all of the individual pieces, it would cost more than all of them put together. So, yeah. Hey. 
I'm still using Photoshop CS3. I'm using 3D Studio Max 2011. This one goes to 11. The only reason my ZBrush is up to date is because ZBrush's updates are all free. Yeah, yeah, that, that sucks. Yeah. As for Changeling, Changeling is difficult to do simply because every universe has a different definition of Changeling. In the Palladium systems, there that's a term for basically good aligned doppelgangers. In D and D, a changeling is a not even a, really a thing. And in Myth, it's a kid who was originally born to humans, but the fairies kidnapped him and left an old man in his in place. And in the game changeling, there's all sorts of different. Oh, hello, Ralph. Oof. Yes. Hello. No, you can't have the microphone. Oof. This is Ralph. Yeah. Do you mind, Fuzzball? Do you mind? Come on. What do you think you're doing, huh? What do you think you're doing? Yes, this is Ralph. Give me kitty kisses on the nose. I was wondering why neither he nor Carlton had shown up yet. Normally they're here. Yes. Yeah. Ralphie tail. Ralphie tail. Yes. <laughs> okay. Come on. You want to get down, don't you? And now he's coming around this side. Come on. Come on, buddy. Yeah, see, all of my cats are very, very affectionate. A deep one, maybe. Oh, come on. Come on down. Come on down. Yeah. Oh, now he's scared because it's too steep to climb without him digging into me. So, there we go, little buddy. Yeah, see, that's the thing. When I purchased these programs, there was just the one uh, purchase. It wasn't a monthly fee. Oh, look, there's Carlton. He's waiting his turn. Come on, Carlton. Come on, little buddy. How many times do you just randomly jump in my lap when I'm trying to work? And now when I want you to come on up here, you're just staring at me. Come on. Here he comes. This is Carlton. Looks just like Ralph, except he doesn't have a doesn't have a uh, uh, collar. Well, the thing is, the deep ones do kind of look like frogs. They look like fish men, which, when you combine a fish with a man, ends up looking like a frog. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is Carlton. This is the coward. But yes, this does mean you have now seen all three 
of the little fuzz butts, hadn't you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, he's down in a frog pose? Instead of, you know, well, anyway. Hey. Yeah. Whoa, careful, buddy. One thing about holding cats. Oof. <laughs> the best way to hold a cat is to hold it so that they feel like they can climb off any second. And they won't want to. Whereas if you try to grasp onto them, they'll try to get away. As this little one here mm, is burying his head in my underarm. Anyway, let me try and put him down. Oh, the thing about a deep one sculpt is it would require a lot more sculpting because I'd have to completely reshape the head. And yes, as you can see, the cats frequently get up here. Yeah, Shinju here is the smallest. She's about 10 pounds. Carlton is about 15, and Ralph is about 19. Yeah. She is 12 years old. Those two little black ones are 6. Well, the thing is, the base geometry I used, you could theoretically do that from anything. Any, excuse me, any base geometry. It's just how much you want to tweak it in the sculpting program. Um, I don't know how good Blender's sculpting program, sculpting uh, subroutine is. I do know that there's a program called Sculptress, which is probably a whole lot easier to use because it's a dedicated sculpting program and it is free, just like Blender. And, you know, it's a way to handle things. <sighs> Meanwhile, it is now 10 o'clock, or 10.06. I do believe it is probably time for me to go ahead and go sleepy bye. So, what I would like to do is go ahead and say goodnight. Mm-hmm. I'm going to sleep if I... Well, I'm not going to sleep. I'm going to be logging off of this. But, hey, you know, whatever. Because uh, if I stay up too much longer, you're going to start seeing me going... <laughs> and if that happens, I won't be happy. So, I will see you all on Discord or elsewhere. It is now... Next week, it will be time for another critter. And I don't mean one of these critters. What's funny is when she's sleeping, I start petting her. She goes deeper into her pillow and sleeps deeper. And you are welcome, Brandon. And y'all take care. Let me go ahead and... As soon as I see my hand do a thumbs up, I'm going to cancel, so it'll probably be me standing here in a weird pose for about 10 seconds. <laughs>